don't know if you realize this, that the largest scale model in the world, largest scale model in the world, if, if you're a model builder, and I, and I know that, that today kids probably don't build models like they used to in the old days. You know, when I was a kid, we had model airplanes and model ships and helicopters. And instead of playing computer games, we built models. Okay, now if you ask a kid today probably what's a model, a lot of them will say, what's a model? You know, they don't know. Well, the largest scale model in the world encompasses an area of almost 10,000 square feet. That's 4,000 square feet bigger than our building, right? 10,000 square feet. It includes 895,000 pieces and was built by a team of 100 people in 1964. It's a model of New York City. Model of New York City. It's located in the Queens Museum of Art. It was updated in 1992 to include every single building that was built in New York City before then in all five boroughs of New York City. And while very much out of date, I mean, that was 1992, the model is still billed as the cheapest and the most effective way to get a bird's eye panoramic view of New York City. All you got to do is go pay the, the admission pay, uh, money to go inside. You go inside and you get to walk over it. And it's kind of like a helicopter ride looking down on New York City as it was in 1992. Well, in a sense, that's what Romans 4 is. Romans 4 is giving us a model of faith. It is giving us a panoramic view of how everyone who is saved was saved. And the model that Paul uses is Abraham. Everyone that is saved is saved the same way that Abraham was saved. By grace through faith. And in Romans chapter 4, Paul gives us this model. He uses Abraham to really show us and give us this panoramic viewpoint of how God justifies people by grace through faith. And it's a great choice because to the Jews, Abraham was the model of justification or salvation by religious ceremonialism, by religiosity and by good works. That's they they would use Abraham as their model of being saved by works. And they believed that that's what Abraham was all about, that Abraham was a religious man, that because he was circumcised, some of them, not knowing their history, would say because he kept the law, not knowing that the law wasn't given until 430 years later. They would say, well, Abraham is the model of salvation through works. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Abraham is the model of salvation that comes through grace alone and through faith alone. So contrary to what you've been taught, Paul is saying, contrary to what you are teaching, Abraham was not justified and saved by being a religious man or by religious works or being a good man. He was saved the same way that you and I are saved. Through grace, by faith. Now, if you want the cliff notes on Romans chapter 4, here they are. Abraham, as the model for all who have been and will be justified before God, reveals to us that salvation is not achieved by one's good deeds, good works, good intentions, religious heritage, ability to keep the law, be good, or by any human effort of any kind. Rather, salvation is by God's grace alone and by God's power alone through faith alone. Now, why spend so much time working through Romans 4? Because Romans 4 has given us the foundation of salvation. Every apostasy, every major theological error that occurs in the church occurs in the basis of salvation. That's why he spends so much time going through the basics of how we were saved and breaking it down into little elements so that we can understand those elements and understand our salvation so we don't jump off into heresy. And so he spends a great deal of time doing this. 
And specifically in our section of verses for today, which is going to be verses 13 through 17, we're going to be learning three very important truths about faith, saving faith from the model God provides us in Abraham. And in a nutshell, what we're going to see today is that whereas we are saved and receive God's promise by faith alone, it is a faith that does not stand alone. It is dependent upon and it is in complete accord with the grace and the sovereign purposes of God alone. Let me give that to you again. Whereas we are saved and we do receive God's promises by faith alone, it's not a faith that stands alone. It is a faith that is dependent upon and in complete accord with the grace of God And the sovereign purposes of God alone. Now, in verses 13 through 15, we're going to see the first truth. And it's simply this. Faith is incompatible with works and law. Faith is incompatible with works and law. He says in verse 13, this is where we left off last week. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there also is no violation. Now, the promise that Paul mentions in verse 13 is the Abrahamic covenant. It was given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. It was repeated in chapter 15, chapter 18, and again in chapter 22 of the book of Genesis. And in this covenant, God essentially promises Abraham that he's going to give him great land and make out of him a great nation and give him descendants that will be as numerous as the sand of the sea or the stars in the heavens, and that through Abraham, all of the families of the earth, in fact, all the nations of the earth, are going to be blessed. And the real powerful thing about the promise, this covenant that Paul is raising here in verse 13, is that all Abraham had to do to see it come to fruition was to believe God. And that's exactly what Abraham did. Look with me back at Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15. As God begins to lay out this covenant, this promise for Abraham... And at this time, he's still Abram. God hasn't changed his name to Abraham yet. But as God lays it out and in highlighting one aspect of that covenant, that he was going to have a son. And keep in mind that Abraham is married to a barren woman. She is 90. He's 99. It's almost an impossibility in his mind. And those are exactly the kinds of odds that God loves. God loves impossible odds. So if you're in a place where you are trusting God for the impossible, you are probably exactly where God wants you to be, because those are the kinds of odds that God likes, the impossible kinds of odds. And so God tells him, you're going to have a son, and through this son, you're going to have descendants. And in verse 5, he took him outside and he said, look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Now look at verse 6. Then he believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, reckoned it to him, Abraham, as righteousness. Abraham was Reckoned righteous because he believed God, because he believed in God. And so the promise is going to come to fruition through faith, not through circumcision and not through the law. In other words, Abraham did not go out as soon as he had the promise. And as God told him to count the stars, Abraham didn't run out, find a knife and circumcise himself. Nor did he go down to the local synagogue, pull out a copy of the law and start reading it and obeying it to ensure that he was worthy of the promise. Because, again, the law doesn't come into the scene until 430 years later. So he could not have been justified by the law because the law of God, the Mosaic law, did not even exist then. Nor did circumcision, which came 
14 years later. All Abraham did was believe God and God counted that belief, that dependence, that relying, that faith in him as righteousness. Now, note how Romans 4.13 amplifies the promise to Abraham. It says, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world. Now, he had promised him back in Genesis that he would have descendants that were as numerous as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the heavens, that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And here it's amplified to say that he would actually be heir of the world and so would his descendants. Now, what does this mean? Well, again, in the original promise, it says, In thee all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Down in verse 17 of Romans chapter 4, As it is written, A father of many nations have I made you. In other words, by virtue of the fact that Abraham is going to have physical and spiritual descendants that are too numerous to count, so that he's going to be called the father of many nations. And because through Abraham, every family on the earth is going to be blessed, Abraham's going to be the heir of the world. Because everything and everyone on the world is going to be impacted in some way, shape, or form through this promise that's going to be given to Abraham, either positively or negatively as well. There's going to be a negative aspect to this as well. And the reason why he's going to have so many descendants, both physical and spiritual, and the reason why he's going to be the father of many nations, and the reason why through him every family on earth is going to be blessed, is because through Abraham the Redeemer, or the Messiah, is going to come. It is in Abraham's loins that the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, or the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is going to come. Look over at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul speaks about this. And he says, now the promises, talking about the individual aspects of that Abrahamic covenant that was given to Abraham. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed. That is Christ. Notice that Paul says that the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed and that the seed is Christ. In other words, the promise given to Abraham of inheriting the earth is only realized through Jesus Christ, who is the seed or is the descendant of Abraham through whom God is going to fulfill the promise. So in essence, it's only in Christ that all of the people of the earth and every family on the earth is going to be blessed. Now look down at verse 29 of Galatians 3. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. If you have descendants, literally it's seed. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Through union with Christ in salvation, we enter into the promise that was given to Abraham. Just as Abraham will be an heir of the earth, so will everyone who enters into union with that promise through union with Jesus Christ. You see, when you put your faith in Christ, who is the seed of Abraham, you become a child of faith. And in that sense, spiritually, a son of Abraham, who is the model of faith for anyone and everyone who believes and is saved. And thus you become a co-heir with Abraham of this promise to inherit the world. Now, if you have trouble with that, remember Romans chapter 8 and verse 17, where the Lord says that believers are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ who again is the seed. So, as heirs of God, we inherit what God grants. 
as joint heirs with Christ, we inherit what God grants to Christ. And what does God grant to Christ? What does he give to Christ? Go with me to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, God gives Daniel a vision. And it's a vision of the events that are going to take place in world history. He talks about the kingdoms of the earth, one that will be contemporary to him, another that will be contemporary, the Babylonian Empire, the Medes and the Persians. He talks about the Greeks that will come to power, about Rome. And he talks about ten kings that will come out of Rome, and then one will come out of those ten kings, the little horn, which will be Antichrist. But he talks about the fact that God is going to decree judgment upon this last kingdom of the earth, which will be the kingdom of Antichrist. And if you look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, 14, it says, I kept looking in the night visions, and this is after this, this judgment has been decreed by the Ancient of Days in verses 9 through 10. It says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. That's Jesus Christ. That's the Messiah. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. It's interesting that there are some who, who look at this and they say, well, you know, all the other kingdoms are literal kingdoms on the earth, but this one's not going to be a literal kingdom on the earth. It's going to be a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men. And yet this is a kingdom that's going to include people and nations and people of all languages who are going to be serving Christ. It's not going to pass away like the other kingdoms pass away. It's not going to be destroyed like the other kingdoms are destroyed. He's talking about a literal kingdom that's going to be on the face of the earth that Jesus Christ is going to receive and is going to rule in over real people. Now, what's interesting is that Jesus comes first and then is given the kingdom. It's not the church establishing the kingdom and then Jesus coming. Or it's not that there's a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men and that's all there is. And Jesus comes back and we move into the eternal state without a literal kingdom. The son of man comes first and then he is given a kingdom. And we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ, entering in to that promise that was given to Abraham and to his seed. If you look down at verse 27, after the vision is interpreted, starting in Daniel, verse 15, on through 27, and God is giving Daniel more information and elaborating on what he has seen in fact, if you look in verse 21, it says, I kept looking and that horn, that's the little horn that comes out of those ten kings. Antichrist, I was looking and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the ancient of days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Then he said the fourth beast, that's going to be Rome, will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten kings out of this kingdom, as for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise and another will arise after them and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. But the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Now look at verse 27. Then the sovereignty, the dominion and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. 
His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the dominions will serve and obey him. We are co-heirs with Christ. And so that kingdom that he receives is a kingdom that God's people also receive. In Christ, we do inherit the world. In Christ, we do enter into a kingdom on this earth and we do reign with Christ. That's what Revelation 5, 9 through 10 is all about. Romans 8, 19 through 23, and you can look these up later. Talk about the whole creation waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, groaning so that as the sons of God are revealed, creation will be restored back to its original state as well. Listen, as believers in Christ, we are one with Christ and thus one with the seed that was to come through Abraham at just the right time in history to go to the cross as God incarnate as a man. So as to die in the place of everyone who will believe and thus redeem them from their sins. So as to be recipients of Abraham's promise, which in part is the earth. Now look over at Genesis 315. Look at Genesis 315. Adam has sinned, he has disobeyed God, and he has eaten of the fruit of the tree that he was not supposed to have eaten from. The fall occurs, verse 8, man is hiding from God, he's fallen into sin, he's ashamed, he's guilty, and God begins to deal with the participants in this fall. And he talks to the serpent and he says in verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field on your belly. You will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. The seed of the woman is the redeemer. The seed of the woman that is spoken of here in Genesis 3, Genesis 3.15 is that one who was going to come through Eve. That one who was going to come and be the one who was going to be bruised by Satan and yet was going to crush Satan by crushing his works and crushing sin. And so here you have Abraham's seed being referred to as the seed of the woman, the one who is going to crush Satan and the one who is going to give back to man his original destiny, which was to rule the earth, which was to have dominion over the earth. God hasn't forgotten his original plan. His original plan given in the creation mandate was that man would rule and fill the earth and subdue it. And when man chose to sin, he fell into sin. And God had to actually curse the earth to bring the earth back underneath man, fallen man. But one day God is going to restore earth back to its original place. And he is also going to give it back to those people who have entered into the promise of Abraham, who are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That is God and who are able now to rule this earth. So go back to Romans chapter 4. It says, verse 13, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law. It wasn't given through the law. The law does not come into existence again for 430 years, but through the righteousness of faith. This promise is given through faith alone. It will be brought to fruition through faith alone, not through the law. And then in verse 14, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. If you can see this promise brought to fruition by obeying the law, any law, then faith is made void and the promise is completely nullified, voided. Verse 15, for the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there also is no violation. 
The law was meant to show people of their need of a savior. It was designed to show them how far they were from God, how out of fellowship they were, their inability to attain to his standards. Had there been no law, we would not have known that we needed a savior because we would never have known that we had offended God. And so in these three verses, what saving faith is being shown to us is is as something that is incompatible with law. It's it's not able to to be compatible with law or compatible with good works of any kind. Now, if you look down at verse 16, we'll see what faith is compatible with. It says, for this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Listen, for those who have the law and the law as a tutor leads them to Christ. And for those people who did not have the law and are brought to saving faith in Christ as Gentiles, both descendants of Abraham through faith, not through the law, not through works, not through circumcision. He says faith is compatible with grace. It's not compatible with the law. It's not compatible with works. It's not compatible with religious ceremony, but it is compatible with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed. Listen, it's important to understand that even though faith alone is what saves a person. That faith never operates alone, never operates alone in the sense that it is ever independent of God's grace, never operates independent of God's grace. Were it not for God's grace providing a way of salvation, no one's faith would save them because say faith cannot operate alone or else all it is is a meritorious work. If all you say is that I have been saved by faith apart from grace, then you have done a work in your believing. It becomes a meritorious work. Faith never operates independent of God's grace, because if it did, it would be a meritorious work that we exercise to earn salvation. The power of salvation is not found in your faith. It's not found in your faith. The power of salvation is found in God's grace. The means is through faith. Abraham's faith was not in itself righteousness. Rather, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness on the basis of the fact that God would provide the person with saving faith, the very righteousness of Christ himself. And that's what he's saying in verse 16. But he goes even further than that. Look at verse 17, because not Only is faith in accordance with and dependent upon God's sovereign grace. In verse 17, we see that faith is called into being by God's sovereign power. Look what it says. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him whom he believed, even God. That's important there because what it shows us there is that God is the object of saving faith. The promise is not the object of saving faith. God is the object of saving faith. It's interesting that when Abraham believed the promise in Genesis 15, 6, it says, and Abraham believed in the Lord. You can't separate the promise of God from God. If you're going to believe in the Lord, you're going to have to believe his promise as well. But the object of saving faith is God himself. It is the Lord. And look what it says in the last part of verse 17. Even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. There's a lot of people that like to separate that last phrase out and say that this is not referring to faith. The problem is, is that in 25 verses, 17 times Paul is talking about saving faith. Faith is what is in question here. Some people will say, well, what we're talking about here is that God gives life to the dead, calls into being as in creation, that which does not exist. Well, that is true, but that's not what he's referring to here. What he's referring to here is that God is the one 
who calls into existence in an unbeliever's life even the very faith to believe in God. And that had God not called into being the faith to believe, no one could believe. We don't conjure up the faith that is necessary to believe God and to believe in God. That has to be given to us. And so here at the end of verse 17, he's saying that God is the one who gives life to the dead. He is the one that brings spiritually dead people to life. He's the one that regenerates their hearts so that they can see Christ and so that they can desire Christ. But not only that, not only does he regenerate those who are spiritually dead so that they have spiritual life and desire God and desire Christ. He also calls into being that which does not exist and that which he calls into being is the faith to believe. Listen, we are saved by faith, but it is a faith. That is given to us by God. Yes, we are saved by a faith that is our own. We have to exercise our faith in Christ. But that's the faith that finds its source in God. He gives us that faith. And so grace not only gives us what we don't deserve. It gives us what we cannot in and of ourselves even produce. The faith to believe and the faith to be saved. Verse 18, in hope against hope, he believed. That is true. Abraham did have to exercise that faith. He did have to believe against all the odds. But he only believed because God gave him the faith to believe. God called into existence that which did not exist in his life, which was saving faith. A little understanding of the last phrase in verse 17 would go something like this. God speaks to non-existent things as though they existed. And then they come into being and really do exist. And since the whole context of this chapter is concerning saving faith, Paul's point is that when you and I were saved, it was because God spoke into existence, into our life. The very faith we needed in order to believe in Christ. And when he did that, Your faith indeed did come into existence and you believed and you were saved. In other words, even the faith required to believe and be saved was a gift of God. Isn't that what it says in Ephesians chapter 2? Look, Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. In other words, you can't even boast that you had the faith to believe because had God not given you even the faith, you would not have believed. That's how spiritually dead we were in our trespasses and sins. God had to bring us to life spiritually and give us the very faith that was necessary to believe. And so our salvation is all of grace. There's not one aspect of our salvation that has anything to do with human effort at all. There's absolutely nothing that we did or did not do to obtain it. Even the faith to believe and thus be saved was given to us by God. And if this was the kind of faith that was given to us by God, we really had no choice but to believe. Because what God calls, God effectually brings into being. And if he gave us the faith to believe, we were going to believe because God, when he sends his faith, does not ever fail to achieve the salvation That God sends it to accomplish. And so if you're a child of God by virtue of having placed saving faith in Jesus Christ alone to save you from your sins. It's only because of God's wondrous grace. In giving you this faith to see Christ and to believe. And that is why saving faith has nothing to do with religious ceremonies, religiosity, the law, good works. It is all of grace. And so again. 
Whereas we are saved and we receive God's promise by faith alone. It is a faith that does not stand alone. It's dependent upon and in complete accord with the grace and the sovereign purpose of God alone. Salvation is all of grace and none of us. Father, we thank you that it is so. We thank you that our acceptance with you, which is based upon our justification, our salvation, has nothing to do with us and everything to do with you, has nothing to do with works and everything to do with grace. And we recognize, Father, that there is nothing that we have done or been that deserves this. This is all the result and the benefit of sovereign grace. And we thank you for that. For not only choosing us from the foundation of the world, but giving us the very faith that was necessary to believe. And Father, we pray that you will cause us to glory in and rejoice in our salvation. And Father, that we would see what you have accomplished in our lives so that you would be glorified and so that we would receive the joy. Help us, Father, to be secure in you, secure in your great love, secure in your promise, because we are secure in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.